Okay, well, we'll get started. I want to thank everybody for coming today on a Friday morning when a lot of people <coughs> are probably not working and starting their weekends. I'm really delighted to have um, one of my friends and a person that I've admired for many, many years and whose father I've admired for even more years, uh, Vinyari Ratna, who will really give us a briefing on how Sarvodia works, and then he suggested that it could be a real roundtable discussion because so many of you have so much experience with all this. So um, without any further ado, I'll introduce Vinya. Thank you, John, and I would like to uh, thank John and uh, Sangha Project for organizing this roundtable. Uh, some of our other colleagues were also supposed to come, but I think the weather, as you say, uh, the fr being a Friday morning, I think they might find it difficult. But uh, <clears throat> I'm happy that uh, some of you are very familiar and still are very closely engaged with Sri Lanka, like uh, Nilufa and Mona. <laughs> and uh, Andy has been a volunteer for Sarvodaya uh, 30 years back, and so he's still connected in a big way uh, and have been following and supporting our work. So thank you very much for taking uh, time off from your busy schedule to be here today. So what I'll do is actually, I, I have a long presentation, but I will not go on the long track, but because some of you are little uh, new to Sarvode, I would give a basic introduction to Sarvode, not go into uh, intra introduction about Sri Lanka, straight away to Sarvode. And I, I was planning to just introduce what our Sarvode development model, uh, what it is and uh, its uh, philosophical basis. And also because a uh, uh, lot of our current work is affected by what happened in Sri Lanka during the last three decades uh, with, the, with the civil war. I wanted to touch a little bit on our, uh, uh, our work in relation to the uh, post-war uh, conditions in Sri Lanka and where we are now as a country and it's a very sort of Sarvode reading. Uh, some things uh, perhaps uh, not everybody will agree, but uh, then what is our sort of uh, plan for the future? So basically, as uh, most of you know very well, uh, Sri Lanka is a you know multi-ethnic and a multi-religious nation, which have also uh, been the uh, being some of the underlying reasons why we uh, faced a conflict. Um, um, however, even despite the war happening in Sri Lanka, we have been able to, on the average, maintain the social uh, standards, uh, social progress uh, indicators uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. However, there have been drastic disparities, although, say, for example, if you get the infant mortality rate, which is a single digit, uh, which is not the case in some areas of Washington, D.C. Right. Um, uh, uh, but if you look at the plantation areas, north and east, it's double this this uh, national average. So disparities, both in terms of uh, economic progress and so uh, income distribution and social uh, progress, it has been uh, uh, quite alarming, and uh, <coughs> uh, it has been a concern. So Sarvodaya Shramadana movement uh, was founded in late 1950s by my father who is a very close friend of uh, John as well and known to some of you. Um, the, the word Sarvode came from Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, of course, he defines Sarvode as welfare of all, but uh, it's a Sanskrit word, Sarva Udayam or Sarva Udaya, awakening of all. And uh, Shramadana is actually the more Buddhistic approach to development, sharing your time, thoughts and energy, although the literal meaning is Shrama is labor, Dana is uh, sharing or gifting. So um, the pioneers of the movement uh, really interpreted this notion of sharing, uh, giving into a, uh, a much wider meaning by getting the people to contribute to their own uh, well-being and the, their community's well-being. So um, uh, the philosophy uh, really uh, defines development as an awakening process happening at an individual level, starting at an individual level, then extending to your family, then the village, urban communities, country as a whole, and extending to the world. So it's a very universal uh, philosophy or a universal uh, uh, expression of, uh, uh, of deep humanity. And we also define, the, uh, define development as 
not just as social and economic development how it is conventionally uh, uh, defined but also as a process of spiritual development moral development cultural development which go hand in hand with social economic and political development so um, the movement has been um, adopting what we call a holistic approach or an integrated approach uh, so what we mean by a holistic approach is that we recognize that everything is connected to everything else as uh, human beings we are connected to each other we are connected to our nature we are connected to other systems in the in the society so th and also there are multiple determinants of poverty which we, of course we all know uh, and development is not just an outcome but it's also a process how you get there how do you fulfill basic needs of people so uh, this holistic uh, view is really taking uh, this notion of well-being uh, of both physical psychological spiritual uh, and trying to build this well-being from an individual level to uh, the global level so uh, for sarvodaya development is an awakening process in all these six dimensions and we have always uh, recognized that poverty cannot be taken in isolation people are powerless due to various reasons maybe due to caste creed or many other reasons people also feel powerless so you have to work towards empowerment of the communities so in late 1950s so this was the uh, uh, the philosophical basis on which the movement started and a country which has been under colonial rule for nearly 400 years and the last phase being uh, under uh, british rule for 140 uh, odd years so uh, people were also looking for an indigenous uh, kind of uh, movement uh, to to define its own de development path for the future so uh, sarvodaya was an idea a philosophy that uh, uh, initiated a process of self development in these communities we are uh, a group of uh, students and teachers led by the founder my father who went and started living in the communities really trying to understand what their problems were and then trying to work out solutions with them so uh, a, a model evolved through practice so it was not starting something with theory and then going to the community and then that whole uh, self development process evolved into a much complex today uh, a, a national Uh, organization with a huge network uh, which specializes in various uh, uh, sectors of development so we provide uh, uh, support to those who wanted change in themselves so we didn't go and hunt for communities to work because we had some project funding or grant from somebody so it was demand driven but of course there were exceptions when we Uh, got to know that they are very very isolated marginalized communities we of course uh, then uh, went in search of such communities and supported them so basically i can summarize this whole concept of awakening in a, a motto called we build the road road builds us and at that at the time <coughs> the movement started uh, the physical access to the rural hinterland was very difficult so people if you go to a village they'll say you know uh, we have difficulty in reaching the hospital or going to uh, uh, sending our children to school even though these services were all free uh, since independence or even before that so uh, road access was something it was a common need so people got together to construct the road uh, putting their time and energy voluntarily and people from outside also coming students from villages uh, other villages and even kalambu schools coming together building the road so it was a, a structured learning program where you really get to reflect about your own self how you relate with other people so that is the meaning when you build the road and in the process you build yourself so awaken yourself so from 1958 we have come a very very long uh, journey you know so starting with one village in 1958 uh, uh, it is um, okay i can fix this this one that support yeah yes so <laughs> in the middle that's my father and uh, starting with one village uh, uh, it has now reached to about 15000 villages it doesn't mean that in every uh, one of these 15000 villages we have a full range of programs it's one way or the other 15000 out of about 38000 villages have been reached by sarvodaya <coughs> so in 
So the spiritual element uh, plays an important role, even though that's uh, the philosophy is derived from Gandhian and Buddhist uh, teachings. It's a very inclusive uh, organization or a movement in terms of its implementation, where all ethnic groups, all religions are represented, not only represented, but our workforce, uh, both volunteers and full-time workers are multi-ethnic and multi-religious. So basically we would like, you know, as most of you are in the humanitarian or development sector, we join that sector with a passion, something, a call coming from within, uh, not just because uh, it's a job. So we thought that these four Buddhist principles, uh, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka, what we call uh, Brahma Viharas or Sublime Abodes, uh, was uh, uh, kind of the uh, <coughs> principle that uh, was used to awaken individuals. Metta is loving kindness because you feel for others, uh, but you don't just stop there. You feel for others, but you do something. So we call Karuna, generally uh, known as compassion, compassionate action. You do something about it. When you do something about it, and you, you, you see, see the positive results, then you get a joy, uh, that is called mudita. That's what keeps us going, right. even, you know, several decades, you know. Um, but you don't always get a positive result. Sometimes you will be blamed, you won't, you know, you'll be harassed. So you have to have equanimity, a balanced mind. So how do you then develop a personality where you can, you know, withstand uh, both uh, praise as well as uh, blame and uh, harassment and really have a balanced mind. <coughs> So while you uh, practice those principles at an individual level, we got the communities also to practice at a, at a, a group level. So group level principles were called four principles of social conduct or Satra Sangraha Vastu, which again comes from the Buddhist teachings. So uh, one principal tenant is dana or sharing or giving. So you share. In the process, you also developed a kind of a simple lifestyle. And then you have a pleasant language, you don't uh, hurt other people, you know, you uh, try to be constructive in all uh, what you do. And then always promote equality. So this, uh, when you organize a work camp to build a road or build a preschool or a school, uh, these principles are really put in practice. So uh, people feel, uh, it's not that we tell, okay, these are the principles you practice. No, it, it's uh, the, the program is structured in a such a way that these principles will automatically come out of the action. So uh, anyone, even a non-Buddhist will feel that this is part of our own uh, spiritual practice, not really the organized religion, you know, uh, that we, we see today. So with these principles, we were able to come up with a model which was very holistic in each community that <clears throat> really make them self-reliant. And this model also evolved through action uh, learned from um, uh, years and years of work. So by the second <coughs> decade of the movement or third decade, uh, we were able to uh, put in a, uh, uh, put a more formal process in all the communities that were working, starting with one village in 1958, expanded to 100 villages by the end of the first decade, by 1968. And since then, we were uh, being uh, sort of uh, asked, invited to share our experience in other villages. So huge mobilization took place. So initially you try to actually build what you call the psychological infrastructure, not the physical infrastructure. We believe that entry point can't be just economic development. That's uh, what distinguishes Sarvodaya from many other organizations. They, they will feel okay. Of course, uh, there are different models, but our model is that we, before we enter into any form of economic empowerment activity, we prepare the ground for that, the mindset, uh, the cohesion in the community and so on. So for which that Shramadana or sharing of labor camps is one. There are many other techniques that we have evolved. Then you have to organize the community in a little bit more formal way. The women need to be organized. They need to understand what are the issues affected by the women and children, youth, the farmers and elders. So like that, we, we have what you call group formation, which is the social infrastructure development. But it won't happen automatically. You need to support. You need to get some village leaders trained, preschool teachers trained in nutrition and health and so on. So uh, Sarvodhi spent a lot of 
time and investment uh, in developing that infrastructure capacity in a community, then the satisfaction of what we call 10 basic human needs is around which that we mobilize the community. So these 10 basic human needs are identified to what extent that each village or each community has fulfilled. So there are gaps. Then the community itself will decide, okay, in terms of housing, maybe only 10% of the village houses are permanent um, uh, and suitable for a healthy living. So what can we do about it? Can we have a Shramadana plan for maybe not just one year, two, three years? On a priority basis, we get together, we get the help of the government also, we put up a, a, a plan. So that, that, is, that becomes the basis of community action at what we call at the third stage of development, satisfaction of basic human needs and institutional development. Now here you need, by this time, a community organization, a formal organization, what you call CBOs in general development work, community-based organization. Uh, which will take control and be also and this was very revolutionary in the 1980s because uh, earlier also there were community based organizations in Sri Lanka but they didn't have really a legal basis they didn't have a membership they didn't have you know a constitution they didn't have bank accounts you know so uh, Sarvodi introduced formalizing community based organizations in nine, uh, early 1980s and uh, identified uh, a suitable legislation it was done by uh, a group of lawyers and I think this uh, happened when Andy was uh, there at that time and uh, uh, so the communities were very enthusiastic to get their organization registered, have an annual general meeting, elect their own president, treasurer and it, it was a wonderful uh, sort of uh, democracy in practice at a grassroots level. So since then, out of these large numbers of villages that Sarvodaya was working, when they fulfilled certain criteria, we got them registered under the society's ordinance, which is the uh, main legislation that uh, enables a, 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 a community-based organization to get registered. So, uh, by now, we have about 5,400 villages which are registered. Not all have been very successful. There have been some you know, uh, uh, drops in uh, enthusiasm and all that, but over 80% success we have been able to maintain. Still about 3,000 villages throughout the country, including the North and East, are having uh, these registered societies. And only when you have a legal entity at the village level, we start income and employment generation activities, our microfinance. So, first you build the, uh, the capacity and a legal uh, form, then only you enter into uh, other uh, more sophisticated uh, economic development work. So there we have a, <coughs> a, a microfinance organization which is one of the first uh, modern microfinance organizations in Sri Lanka started in late 1980s. They support the village organization to identify suitable enterprises to support from individual enterprises or collective enterprises provide not just loans, small and medium scale loans but also technical advice market linkages and even now of course we have even entered into use of uh, uh, mobile uh, connectivity, internet and some villages have their own uh, websites uh, you know selling their products so it has become much more sophisticated now uh, and finally we want those villages to be self-sustaining, self-reliant and also share their experience with other villages. So what we do is once they reach this village, fifth stage of village development, which may happen be, uh, anywhere between three to five years time on the average, um, uh, they are able to uh, help mobilize another village. So we have now, I could very confidently say about 1,200 villages throughout the country, which are completely self stage self five. Stage five. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so on their own and they even pay if they want a training, specialized training, they even pay for the, some, some youth from the village to come and undergo that training. So uh, we are happy with the, that kind of model which has evolved. So for uh, each of the stages, then a support structure also evolved over the years. The main organization which is called the, uh, it is uh, here called the uh, long legal name Lanka Jatika Sarvodhisattvadana Sangame which was the first legal entity incorporated by an act of parliament. Then within that we had divisions for economic development, social mobilization, women's development, child development. Later 
they became independent legal entities because we wanted them to be uh, really <coughs> working on their specialized areas. So uh, today we have an infrastructure, institutional infrastructure, which is uh, reaching 15,000 villages around the country. Uh, it's about mm, two thirds of the villages uh, in Sri Lanka. Not that every village will have all the um, programs that I have uh, mentioned, but then about 3,000 what we call self-governing villages aiming at uh, being, becoming uh, independent villages and really uh, connected to these five-stage uh, uh, villages, about 1,500. And uh, uh, another recent program on governance, which I will explain a little bit in detail later because that's one of our key focuses now. And of course, our, our uh, finance company, which is a regulated uh, body, um, uh, has a network of branches throughout the country. It operates like a bank. <coughs> So we have come a very long way since uh, its founding in 1958. Uh, uh, so with uh, 12 national independent legal bodies and this Sarvodesh Ramadana societies, about 5,400, which are legally registered and really active, uh, about 3,000 and really self-sustaining around 1,200 to 1,500 uh, villages. So. We, were, we are an organization which has evolved uh, through a <coughs> lot of hardships. So the first, uh, first 20 years of the movement, we didn't have any external <coughs> funding. It was all uh, <coughs> volunteer action based on uh, <coughs> people's own contributions. <coughs> Then uh, from the second decade, we had uh, uh, funding coming from individual donors <laughs> and some foundations which have been uh, really identifying with Sarvode vision. It was not based on, you know, like project proposals and <clears throat> big grant agreements like what we have today. And then <clears throat> from 1978, I would say that we had a kind of a technical growth. <clears throat> We are, I mean, we are being very honest in terms of uh, looking at our own uh, uh, approach to uh, funding as well. Uh, so, in the 1980s, with the <coughs> with the uh, with development field, most of you know, uh, becoming much more opening uh, to, towards uh, south and a lot of funding being available to non-governmental organizations. We were receiving uh, through a, 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 a donor consortium quite a bit of funding to expand. <coughs> so from late 1970s to uh, mid 1990s for about 20 years we had significant uh, resources coming in to, su to supplement the, the local resources that we were mobilizing. So we were able to build a quite a big infrastructure and do a lot of work and the war started and with the war we had to do a lot of uh, relief uh, and re rehabilitation work <coughs> to help the internally displaced people then also working towards uh, uh, peace building and really trying to uh, bring a stop to the war. So we became actually a little bit dependent on donor money. And uh, so, uh, when the, with the other changes that were happening internationally, in the early 1990s, the, the Berlin Wall collapsed and, you know, the, the Eastern Europe opened up and the donor priorities suddenly shifted to Eastern Europe and other countries. And, uh, you know, there was no real need uh, for them to support uh, uh, countries like uh, Sri Lanka, which were anyway having better social progress, as, as I have shared earlier with you. So we faced a bit of a crisis in the mid-1990s. So we thought we, it's a good lesson. Many organizations would have collapsed if uh, they were in this, uh, this predicament. But uh, we decided, OK, we'll restructure and aim when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary 10 years on, we'll, we'll really uh, put the organization in a different footing. So that's the time that I had personally, I, I got uh, trained as a medical doctor, then I was working in the government uh, from 1990 as a frontline uh, junior doctor in a war affected area and then uh, for 10 years I was uh, uh, working as both as a public health practitioner, doctor and 
and an academic and then I was voluntarily also helping in this transition because I was not an employee of the organization, I was very much independent but uh, really helping out in this uh, transition. Then in 2000 I also joined Sarvodhya on a full time basis and uh, so the last uh, decade, that's the decade between 1998 and 2008, we really restructured the organization, brought in some new talent to the organization also from outside because generally we had a volunteer uh, base and some of them uh, with their you know leadership skills and after demonstrating really uh, ability to work in communities became district coordinators and became you know senior managers so in a changing complex environment both economically politically we couldn't just uh, rely on those volunteers who became full-time workers we needed to bring in you know uh, people who are specialized in uh, microfinance, management, uh, personnel management, uh, then various fields like health, nutrition, environment, biodiversity. So uh, with uh, me also coming in, I was able to attract some of these uh, passionate professionals uh, who didn't come for money as you all know in this sector. Uh, sometimes they, they, people come for you know glamour and all that but uh, uh, we were able to attract some excellent leaders. <coughs> from outside. So we had a mix of these uh, uh, people who uh, came from the from the process within and those who came from out, outside who identified with the vision. But it was a challenge for us to, you know, uh, not to have uh, salary disparities and all that. So it was a huge challenge. But we worked out a system and now we are a very well recognized organization where, you know, people really would like to apply and come. So we were able to balance from being a people's movement and, and a professional organization. So then with, uh, by 2008, we really wanted us to become a self-sustaining people's movement. So learning from the lessons of that previous decade, fourth decade, that not to become too dependent on, uh, on donor funding, we started our own income generation projects. We diversified, say, like uh, what you are, you are doing here in interaction, you know, we have in, uh, very uh, uh, good facilities for uh, training, conferencing, and also uh, uh, hostel facilities throughout the country. So we upgraded those uh, facilities uh, with whatever the donor funding we had and uh, started renting them out uh, in a, for organizations when we are not using those facilities. Mm -hmm. Then certain export products that we had from villages where we have been supporting, uh, which were uh, very attractive to uh, <coughs> northern uh, you know, uh, customers. So we have these traditional handicrafts which are exported through the Sarvo the Export Unit. Then we have, uh, we produce some of the best uh, preschool uh, educational toys and furniture in Sri Lanka. So it's uh, so we had several social enterprises which were bringing in an income. So slowly that percentage which was like 5% of the co-budget of Sarvode today has increased to about 60%. So 60% of our co-budget uh, is generated from within the organization. Then we also started developing an endowment fund which is very small at the moment. But at least the the, the, the culture changed within the organization that everyone was looking at how to you know sustain our, our units program. So that way uh, a new journey started and also the country context has changed that I am going to describe now. Uh, I am talking about exactly 10 years ago what was the situation. So Sri Lanka uh, graduated from a low income country to a middle income country. Uh, the cutoff point, I think, is 3,000 US dollars per capita GNP. So we exceeded at uh, 2,800, uh, according to World Bank classification. So we are a low middle income country. and But the armed conflict was uh, continuing. But we saw the signs of its end because both parties uh, were not willing to negotiate uh, uh, for a settlement. And we knew that the government had the upper hand because of the global uh, you know, movement against terrorism and all that. So, government with its resources were able to crush the LTTE one year later. And I'm going to come back to that in a little while. So, but as I mentioned earlier, though the national indicators were really good, <coughs> the uh, regional uh, uh, progress was lagging, especially North and East. And decreasing development assistance came to non-governmental sector. 
except in specialized areas like uh, conflict resolution, peace building like NID has been supporting a lot of democracy programs. <clears throat> but for the traditional development work that we were doing, water and sanitation, child development, nutrition, health, all right down. So <clears throat> the, at the same time, the state sector or the government become, became highly resourced. Uh, uh, you know, World Bank uh, uh, started some big uh, infrastructure, rural infrastructure development uh, projects like uh, water supply and sanitation uh, programs, even microfinance. Now, uh, the positive side of those had been that they adopted the models that we have evolved uh, and scaled up with those resources. So the government copied some of the things. That's how it should be. It's not that in eternally, uh, as charitable institutions or development organizations, we should continue to uh, deliver services. We need to make structural changes so that the government or the state takes responsibility to deliver those to the people. Then, <coughs> however, we realized that still there are structural causes of poverty and powerlessness that we needed to address. So, they were more towards the kind of political empowerment objectives of Sarvode rather than social and economic. So, I would say there was a change in strategy from a, a need-based community empowerment approach mm -hmm. to a rights-based community empowerment <coughs> approach. However, we were in a dilemma because uh, still when something happens, Sarvode is the, is the first name that comes to people, you know, Sarvode should come and help us. You know, it's like the humanitarian brand name, you know, when you have a disaster or something. So, how do you now say, no, 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 now we are, you know, <laughs> not uh, responding to that kind of needs that we are, we want. So, we had to balance that. So, we didn't depart from uh, the, uh, the need-based approach as well. But the, from uh, the por portfolio of our activities, we were focusing more on the right space, trying to influence the government policies, trying to bring about constitutional changes, really intervene in some of the national level discourses on, uh, on political reforms, holding government accountable and that kind of thing. So, now coming to the war, because this is the point at which the war ended. So, as you all know, in May 2009, the war ended after a long uh, ceasefire that lasted uh, for about three to four years. However, finally, the war came to an end through a comprehensive uh, victory for the government forces uh, through military means. So, anywhere between 60,000 to 100,000 people have been killed over a period of 26 years and mostly civilians, then also service personnel, a large number sacrificed their lives and many uh, got wounded, some permanently disabled and also LTT cadres, these are also very young Sri Lankans though they were fighting for a separate state due to various uh, factors. Uh, so we lost a whole generation. We feel the demographic uh, deficit now because when you go to North and East to work, uh, probably with Mona you know that this, you don't get that one co age cohort is missing. Uh, so it's very sad and those were the best, I mean they were, they had the energy, they uh, you know were at the prime of their youth and so that uh, was a big price that country paid. Then about 12,000 uh, LTT carders, some of them were uh, underaged soldiers, uh, were uh, taken into custody and they were on rehabilitation. And huge impact on the economy, property and livelihood. So war coming to an end through military means also opened up new complexities uh, on accountability, violations of human rights, uh, human uh, international humanitarian law, <coughs> violation of human rights law. So, we uh, were, you know, as a national organization, we were somehow engaged, not necessarily uh, um, uh, endorsing the military strategy. We never, we always thought that uh, we have to resolve these conflicts non-violently. Okay, whether we like it or not, it ended which is a good thing. There are no more lives lost at least. So, then while uh, we uh, uh, try to address uh, the, the uh, aftermath of the war, we had to continue our integrated approach and keeping non-violence as the cardinal principle. So, the conflict affected the country uh, disproportionately. Of course, the North and East were the, the theater, theater of the war was in those areas, but then even the other provinces were <coughs> affected. As uh, Nilufa was saying, 
now you are doing some work here in this district on Radhapur and Polundar were very badly affected although they don't belong to the north and the east mm -hmm. here you get uh, largely Sinhalese but also Tamils and mm -hmm. Muslims also living here so they are what you call these adjoining districts to north and east provinces were badly affected but country as a whole was also affected due to terrorist attacks and also uh, the economic hardships were felt by the country throughout. Where are we now? It has been nine years since the end of the war. So there has been significant process, progress in terms of return and resettlement and infrastructure development. However, we are not very happy with the progress towards reconciliation and addressing some of the root causes that led to the war. So um, I would say therefore that Sri Lanka is a country which is in a post-war phase, post-war situation, not in a post-conflict situation because we have not really addressed the underlying determinants mm -hmm. of the, uh, which led to the war. So in this context, there was a significant political change in 2015, uh, where the former regime, which was very popular for defeating the LTT, which was very nationalistic and later became very authoritarian, uh, where even though Sarvodaya was not uh, sort of singularly targeted, uh, the space for uh, civil society operations got very restricted and a um, lot of, uh, 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 lot of uh, civil society leaders were harassed and sometimes uh, you know, detained and <coughs> questioned by security forces and then some of the uh, media personnel, journalists were abducted and killed. So it was a very, very difficult period in general for the civil society which were more vocal about human rights and uh, preserving democracy in Sri Lanka. So the uh, 2015 political change was a very welcoming change for, uh, for, the, for the country, although we didn't, couldn't take a partisan position, uh, we didn't support uh, any party, but uh, we supported the return of democracy. So, <clears throat> however, um, we have some problems now and uh, so I would just touch a little bit on our reconciliation approach and wind up for discussion. So we have always been uh, as a development and a humanitarian organization responding to disasters. So the armed conflict is of course a, a much overriding disaster but parallelly we had cyclones, we had the 2004 tsunami and uh, you know that tsunami also affected the uh, north and the east which was already affected by the war so it was like a double calamity for the people living in those areas you know on top of the uh, uh, man-made or human-made disaster you get natural disaster so our response has been what you call five r uh, approach that is first you uh, you know without uh, losing time get people mobilized to provide relief stop further uh, harm to the people, particularly the vulnerable, the children, the women and the elderly. So you provide relief, uh, mobilize volunteers. And then um, we move on a little bit when the situation uh, stabilizes, uh, rehabilitation if they can return immediately, we help in that. And then we al also, if the situation permits, really embark without using, losing time on reconstruction. Then reconciliation is also important, reconciliation here, there's a lot of trauma at an individual level uh, and also at, at a community level. So we try to address those uh, through not just counseling and things like that, but also uh, bringing out some creative you know, uh, tools, uh, particularly among children, use of art, music and so on. So reconciliation in a very broad way, uh, then putting them path into the normal development uh, uh, discourse, uh, looking at their basic needs and then really uh, going through the development process that I described earlier, the five-stage development process. So that's the approach that we have been adopting. So um, uh, this I won't go into, but uh, we, we have to look at our society, not just war is only one manifestation of, of the crisis we are facing in Sri Lanka, uh, but the root cause uh, is uh, really poverty, powerlessness, people, particularly young people, don't have, uh, you know, a sense of uh, uh, self-esteem, high self-esteem that, you know, we have a future. Young people across communities want to leave the country for a better job outside Sri Lanka, whether it's to the Middle East or to South Korea or wherever they can earn uh, a decent salary. 
So we uh, see uh, violence towards oneself and violence towards the society. So our approach has been that we would like to address this situation uh, in, in different uh, dimensions. One is through the consciousness. We have to really uh, look at ourselves and how we relate to each other, uh, especially as a multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, society. Then how do we address the economic needs of people, the basic needs of people? Then how do we govern ourselves? So our approach has been, during the last three years, really focused on enhancing this consciousness of people uh, to be tolerant but understanding of other communities and bringing uh, the different communities together, whether it is uh, understanding each other's language or, you know, we, so we had rapid language learning programs, Sinhala communities learning Tamil and Tamil uh, youth <coughs> learning uh, Sinhalese, that kind of thing. And uh, also really rapidly expanding our economic programs with the space that was created because there was no problem of access. You could go to any any part of the world or uh, country, I mean, and uh, uh, especially in the north and the east, though uh, you may have sometimes restrictions on, uh, you know, by the military and so on. But uh, there was in general, uh, to be fair by the government, uh, uh, access was not a big problem. Then we were looking at how we can come up with a governance system that will serve the interests of all communities living in Sri Lanka. So um, we have had, uh, you know, long uh, uh, history of promoting uh, uh, peace through spiritual means, getting together people, peace meditations, peace marches, then linking communities from north and east uh, to communities in the south, and big sort of symbolic meditations in the heart of Colombo, and um, you know, uh, connecting uh, villages on a permanent basis, villages from the south. Sinhala Tamil Muslim villages with the uh, Tamil and Muslim villages in the north. They have exchange visits and really trying to get people to understand each other. So this has worked very, very well and uh, we uh, have been evo uh, able to evolve uh, uh, an indigenous approach towards peace and uh, reconciliation and particularly targeting the youth, particularly uh, youth who are affected by the war. and. Uh, creating not just that harmony between uh, different communities, but also uh, providing opportunities for uh, employment through vocational training and so on. So uh, we, uh, during the last uh, eight years, eight to nine years after the, since the end of the war, uh, the reconciliation became one of the most important programs of the <coughs> there, and we um, defined uh, reconciliation in a much broader way. First, you have to also heal yourself because still you carry a lot of anger. As you know, in countries like South Africa, they had a formal process. Although Sri Lanka, in theory, had many commissions and best recommendations, but nothing was implemented. So uh, we really had to do whatever we could as civil society to fill in that gap. So we were doing a uh, lot of programs to build, rebuild relationships and also how to, to deal with the past, how you, how you forgive and, you know, using examples from other countries and of course of co uh, we need to also advocate for justice so any formal mechanism that government was advocating to address those issues we were consulted we provided very honest and uh, uh, independent uh, uh, recommendations inputs to those processes and also connected the grassroots to formal processes so when the government had any consultation on related to reconciliation in a remote district we publicized through our network and got the real people who were affected by the issues to come and give evidence or come and give uh, their views. <coughs> so um, we were trying to when the government and the political forces were only looking at the political solution, we advocated for a consciousness solution and an economic solution in addition to a political solution. So uh, our activities we had our own profile of activities to uh, provide, you know, support consciousness building, economics. So with the uh, new uh, space that was there, we expanded our uh, economic uh, development programs in the north and the east in particular, vocational training programs, so youth and so on. Then we were able to also concentrate a lot on the power element or democracy uh, element. 
so uh, when the after the change of the government in 2015 government actually adopted the internationally accepted framework which uh, some of you may be familiar with which is called truth reparation justice and guarantee of non recurrence so here uh, there are many uh, uh, people who don't know what happened to their loved ones large numbers of widows are there and the mothers really some mothers still think that their youth their children are uh, living so there's no closure so you have to really know the truth what happened so then how do you uh, deal with uh, the the affected people who are who survived reparation comes into place so can we have economic reconciliation by providing opportunities for youth so sarwood is running large numbers of vocational training programs particularly in the north and the east in new sectors for example tourism has opened up and many people are now uh, many local tourists are there foreign tourists international guests are coming so community tourism and uh, other formal tourism areas you need uh, like uh, hotels uh, uh, are expanding so they have uh, housekeeping jobs then management jobs uh, food and beverages so we have government accredited courses run by us and there are donor partners who, who help us in those programs then political reconciliation we have been part of uh, we gave uh, our inputs to the lessons and um, <coughs> lessons learned uh, commission uh, uh, reconciliation commission then we do lot of work to make sure that at community level there is no tension although new tensions have come up between muslim community and 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 the singhalese and we have had very unfortunate very uh, bad incidents happening during the last uh, one and a half two years uh, however we still feel that there is hope for the country so in each of these areas we continue to uh, structure our programs and also link with the government mechanisms as well so there has been a office for missing persons uh, set up now there's an office for reparations so we try to help in connecting the the affected people so we are not totally unhappy with the progress that the government has made but uh, given the mandate that we had and really the people support that they had i think we missed another opportunity and we are very worried that now we are drifting back to uh, where we started in uh, 2009 which is really really unfortunate so last couple of years we have uh, particularly since 2015 we wanted to bring the people's voice out now this just 3 weeks ago in the east where we had a big gathering uh, on uh, uh, our governance program and reconciliation giving a voice to these people and even uh, them coming in large numbers sometimes people say okay how can you have a dialogue with 600 people but i think it's also uh, just giving them the confidence that there are solidarity from you know people that people have that power to convene so uh, Uh, yeah this is in our uh, headquarters a, a national assembly of uh, the new program the desho day program where the founder my father who is also addressing this so there is a momentum gathering now that the people should play a bigger role in all the reforms that uh, we are expecting then religious tensions need to be reduced so we have to have with this interreligious dialogue so we are promoting in a big way so as we celebrate uh, this is the last few 5 minutes of my presentation uh, as we finish uh, our 59th year and entering the 60th anniversary we again had a very uh, honest re reflection on where we are as an organization and as a movement so we are in a uh, social economic and political crisis uh, maybe the government officials that need to face meeting may not agree with this but uh, we are in a crisis we uh however the country is not collapsing i mean we are not in a in a, you know, in the verge of an economic collapse as such but we see people being uh, driven to the margins uh, which is not very uh, healthy so uh, why because as a country i think there are still committed individuals within the government sector uh, at all levels who really are doing an honest job who are not corrupt and uh, holding the true values of democracy and people as a whole also don't want to return back to war whether it's in the north and the east or the south even though politicians really try to use these differences to incite that there is a 
there is a threat of separation again and arousing people's feeling to get votes and all. So, and we have an, we see an alarming trend that the people, particularly the younger generation, is losing faith in the political structures. Every year we uh, have a voter registration system in Sri Lanka. Unlike in the United States, I think only maybe less than 50% of the population vote uh, for the president uh, in the presidential election. We always had more than 70% uh, of people <coughs> and sometimes over 80% voting in a presidential election. And generally in the uh, uh, parliamentary election over 70%. So, but they have to register to vote. So this year, 2018, registration reflects a, a less proportion of youth who are passing 18 years, which is the legal age for, age for voting, getting registered. Why? Because they are losing uh, faith in this system, because the politicians who promise so many things uh, get elected, don't deliver. So uh, we also sadly see uh, the leaders who promised so many things and came together uh, for a political change, not really uh, delivering those promises and they are working in their own self-interest and we have seen some blatant violations of uh, their, their, their promises, not only uh, not delivering on the promises but also continued corruption. Uh, there was a central bank uh, uh, scandal, uh, bond scandal, which really <coughs> people feel that, you know, people's money uh, was robbed. So uh, the progress towards really recovering this uh, robbed uh, state assets or people's assets, that process is very slow. So we are very disappointed. And political parties themselves are in disarray. So there is a call that a new approach is required. We need a political transformation in Sri Lanka. <coughs> we are sitting and it has to be a citizen-centric approach. So Sarvodaya during the last three, four years have been working on this national reawakening of the show the awakening of the nation program where we wanted to uh, see while we are doing other development, social development work, can we also affect uh, uh, changes in the political system, working with other organizations, uh, working on democracy in Sri Lanka. Uh, so uh, we see that there are a lot of professionals with highest integrity, younger generation community leaders who really want to see can there not be a different political system for the country. So Sarvodaya has been really doing a lot of citizen-centric democratic action and bringing this uh, final element, political element, into uh, our main uh, work. So even though it may be more controversial than development, social and economic development work, there are risks involved, but we, uh, we have to accept the fact that that's a risk uh, worth taking or required <laughs> to be taken uh, if we are to move forward. So this program has uh, brought together uh, a new set of leaders and there are a lot of strategies that we are adopting. One is community action directly, uh, decentralized action uh, to address uh, political issues at a local level. And I'll give you an example how we are doing. We need to uh, have new leaders uh, who can... 356 elected representatives in these local government bodies. And we have, uh, we will hopefully identify 8,356 uh, 8, citizens who will also be counterparts to them. And with a mix of, uh, you know, women, youth leaders, professionals, and who can uh, really work um, uh, as counterparts and holding these local government bodies accountable. So, in uh, lastly, for this to happen, we have identified there is a great leadership vacuum in the country. We need to invest in young leaders, not uh, as Sarvodaya did 20, 30 years ago in social development. We need people, uh, young leaders for political transformation in Sri Lanka, democratic transformation in Sri Lanka. So we have uh, identified many youth networks in Sri Lanka who want that guidance and who really would like to work with us. But uh, we need to come up with uh, a, a kind of a, uh, a structure, a module, content, all that. So we are in the phase of designing that uh, at the moment. And uh, for that, we have created the Sarvode Institute of Higher Learning. Uh, uh, with the 50th anniversary, we created this. But now it's in a very mature stage where 
uh, in different areas of development and governance and political transformation is one such area that we have identified uh, that we need uh, uh, leaders to be trained and we are in the process of now defi uh, designing that leadership program. Hopefully by the end of uh, uh, October we'll be finishing the module. Uh, it's kind of a three-day uh, training program for uh, young leaders, activists and who can then be mobilized around the country to start starting at the local government level then moving up in time to come uh, we have uh, <laughs> parliamentary elections in uh, 2020 so maybe we will have a good pool of uh, competent uh, young leaders who can stand uh, to be uh, elected members in the country's legislature while we will be also uh, doing a lot of other work to uh, change the constitution and so on so that's my story. <laughs> I'll be happy to uh, um, answer any questions or welcome your comments also because some of you are involved in uh, work in Sri Lanka and we can also learn from you. Thank you. Thank you.